Zen arose in China during the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907, as Chan Buddhism. It blends Mahayana Buddhism with the ancient Chinese philosophy of Taoism with its deep reverence for nature. Other influences include the Yogacara and Madhyamaka philosophies. Chan Buddhism arrived in Japan during the 6th century as part of a diplomatic mission. Zen involves meditative practices, Zozen, that help a person towards enlightenment through the paradoxical realization that they are already enlightened. It is remembering and re-establishing one's original nature in daily consciousness. Therefore, it is a process of taking away, not adding, an idea that is counterintuitive to those who are the product of a Western education. Zen practice cultivates a meditative state of no thought, just pure, heightened awareness. This video is a distillation of the underlying truths that are the enduring foundation of this ancient tradition, expressed in simple, modern English. This will help people unfamiliar with ancient Chinese and Japanese modes of expression. Purists might object that this approach departs too far from the purity of the centuries-old teachings. Every effort has been made to preserve the essential meaning of the original teachings and express it in modern language. The outward form that a description like this takes is less important than the meaning that lies at its heart. In any case, the original texts are not difficult to obtain. A few minutes of web searching would produce usable results. For the curious, it might be interesting to listen to both this and the older forms and compare them for fidelity. Or, you could simply read this book and put it into practice. Getting a straight answer to the simple question, what is Zen, can be elusive. The language of traditional Zen is paradoxical, not conducive to a layman's understanding. Thankfully, modern neuroscience can shed some light. The human brain is known to have two distinct halves that think in different ways. The left hemisphere is concerned with rationality and logic. The right thinks intuitively, being concerned with creativity, imagination and aesthetics. Left hemisphere tasks are those that can be described as a process. Procedures you can be taught and replicated. Much of what we learned at school is left brain in nature. Intuition on the other side of the brain cannot be learned or described in procedural terms. It comes up from a deeper place that is not controlled by the rational mind, somewhere closer to your true nature. This is the original mind that our proto-human ancestors had in the distant evolutionary past before the rational mind evolved. It is common today for people's thinking to be dominated by the rational left hemisphere, relegating the intuitive right hemisphere to occasional flights of fancy. Zen silences the compulsive thinking of the left hemisphere replacing it with the wee small voice and quiet impressions of the intuitive right hemisphere. The goal of modern Zen is to integrate the two sides into a functioning whole, just as nature intended. The essence of Zen is simplicity. One day, a university professor visited a Zen master to learn about Zen. The master invited him to sit and offered tea. On pouring the tea, the master did not stop when the cup was full. The professor was distressed to see the tea overflowing onto the floor. The master observed that the professor's mind was like the cup, both were full, no room for anything more. If the professor wanted to learn about Zen, he would have to unlearn what he already knew, Zen Kone. Zen strips away the layers of accumulated knowledge and cultural conditioning that people acquire as they live, beginning as a newborn and continuing up to the current day. Zen subtracts, not adds to knowledge. This idea seems counterintuitive and paradoxical if we believe, as many do, that adding to knowledge is the path to enlightenment. You cannot achieve enlightenment through addition and striving. Enlightenment occurs spontaneously when you subtract all the way down through the layers of conditioning to let the light of your true nature shine through into consciousness. At that point, a person's name, titles, status in society become irrelevant. You become a nameless point of conscious presence in the greater mind of the universe. A blissful drop in the ocean and the whole ocean in a drop. But this is in no way easy. It is quite the hardest thing you will ever do, because letting go of one's identity is a form of ego death. The ego developed in our evolutionary past as a survival mechanism. It strenuously resists any possibility of being nullified. I equate that to the death of the human form it inhabits. The ego's job is to strategize ways to stay alive and it has never stopped doing that from the earliest times. 
Because it feels threatened, the ego goes into hyper-survival mode and produces a hundred reasons that undermine your commitment. That is why Zen is so difficult, and yet paradoxically so attractive to those who realize it is the ultimate challenge to be faced on the spiritual path. Our true nature. Zen could be described as the cessation of thinking, replaced by heightened, non-conceptual awareness of the now moment. Not thinking ideas, things, events, no mental chatter of any kind, no train of compulsive thought conjured up by the ego as it does battle with the world in its struggle to survive. We might recognize the ego as a component of our overall self, one that has convinced us that it is the totality of who we are, when the fact is, we are so much greater than just that. Recognizing how the ego eclipses our true self and knowing that we want our true nature to shine through is the a step towards lessening the influence of ego. To be clear though, we still need the ego to help us negotiate the practical arrangements of life. It has its place, but it must, know its place. Diminishing the ego is necessary because to bring forth our true nature, we strip away the egoically created models of the world that build up over time. They might seem real, but they are misleading. As the old saying goes, all models are wrong, though some are useful. They are subjective, not objective reality. We know this because no two people will have the same inner experience of everyday life. Their impression of events are filtered through their mental models. That means the world as we know it is an illusion. Or perhaps it is more accurate to say that it is a delusion. We must rid ourselves of delusion if we are to make progress. To many in the world, Zen is puzzlingly paradoxical. Perhaps this is its way of deterring dilettantes, those who lack the commitment to make the necessary sacrifice. Zen frees us from the tyranny of the ego and its compulsive delusion. It is not the friend of anyone seeking enlightenment. On that path, the truth, and being prepared to sacrifice whatever is held dear in order to know the truth is paramount. Beginning Steps If you seek to be a Zen practitioner, begin by being someone who has goodwill towards the world, who breathes deeply, and is peacefully mindful of the present moment for much of the time. It does not require learning, rather the unlearning of what you already know. Your aim is to return to the beginner's mind, the fresh, open mind of the child. Having goodwill towards the world means selflessly serving others and not living only for yourself. As the philosopher Daniel Dennett said, the key to happiness is to find something more important than yourself and devote your life to it. The form that this service takes is not so important as the attitude with which it is performed. Breathing deeply, from the abdomen, brings more oxygen into your body, which gives you a feeling of well-being. It seemed obvious to say, breathe deeply, yet when you are preoccupied and stressed one's breathing tends to be shallow. You may not be conscious of it, but the decrease in oxygen has an effect on your sense of well-being and your health. Mindfulness helps you to cultivate the correct breathing habit. In the Indian tradition, oxygen contains prana, the universal life energy that permeates the cosmos. Being mindful has several aspects, whatever you are doing, be fully present when you do it. If you are washing your hands or peeling potatoes, be fully present doing it, not thinking about something else, and not multitasking. You can cultivate the right conditions for mindfulness by simplifying your life, getting rid of the clutter and unnecessary possessions. Establishing daily routines or rituals is also helpful. Satori. You know it is working when you start to have Satori moments. Sometimes translated as enlightenment the Satori experience is a felt sense of connectedness with all things. This is known as Kensho, the experience of your true nature. The underlying phenomenon of Satori is cited in many spiritual traditions, being described as transcendence, enlightenment, awakening. In transhumanistic psychology it is called a peak experience as described by Abraham Maslow. Satori as a transcendent state is not something you can call on demand. The only way to experience it is to create the right conditions and wait for it to happen spontaneously. This transcendent state of consciousness is a natural state of mind of one who is approaching their full human potential. Is Zen a religion? Is Zen Buddhism a religion or is it a philosophy? In truth it is neither. A more accurate description would be to call it applied psychology of an ancient kind. 
When Buddha was asked what he was teaching, he would describe it in simple terms as the way things are. He said people should believe his teachings not out of faith, but because they had tested the truth of it for themselves. Only then should they believe it to be true or not. This concludes our introduction to Zen. If you gained something from this video and want to know more, follow the link in the description for the next video in the series. Thank you.